Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you all for joining us th for tonight's lecture. My name is Maria Garcia, and I'm a senior lecturer and head at the Department of Politics, Languages, and International Studies here at the University of Bath. This evening, we're delighted to be joined by Professor Pierre Ferrier, who will be giving us a lecture on the blue economy as part of the IPR's ongoing event series, Our Oceans, A Deep, a Deep Dive, a series exploring the world's oceans and what climate change maritime trade, and strategic conflict mean for their future. Professor Pierre Feyen is a professor of economics in the Faculty of Business and Law, and he's also the director of the Center for Blue Governance at the University of Portsmouth, where he holds the UNESCO Chair in Ocean Governance. He specializes in development economics, particularly environmental and ecological economics. His work explores the interfaces between the use of natural resources and the development of countries. Pierre's particular area of expertise is the blue economy, the sustainable use of oceans and coastlines for economic growth while preserving the health of ecosystems. He investigates how developing countries can benefit from the use of natural resources in a sustainable way. In a career spanning more than 25 years, he has coordinated of 40 complex multidisciplinary research projects and development programs across Europe, Africa, Asia, the Caribbean, and Pacific coastal countries. And he's done this in collaboration with national research institutions, universities, and policy bodies. He has recently coordinated the Blue Economy Strategy for the African Union, the Regional Action Plan for the Blue Economy of the Indian Ocean Commission, the Blue Economy Strategy of the Intergovernmental Authority for Development, as well as the Blue Economy Strategy for Bangladesh, the Seychelles, Guinea, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and Madagascar. He also, he's also found the time to author and co-author about 150 journal articles and over 30 book chapters, uh, research reports, and consultancy reports. He's also a scientific evaluator for several research councils in the UK, Europe, North America, Africa, and Asia. So as you can see, we've got a fantastic uh, treat in store for us tonight. Once we've heard from Pierre, we'll open things up to the audience for all of you at home for your questions and discussions. And just before we begin, there are just a couple of housekeeping notes that I would like to share with you. If you're on social media, please use the hashtag uh, IPR Oceans or tag us at Uni of Bath IPR. Please note that your cameras and microphones will remain switched off throughout the entire session. If you have a question, please submit your question via the Q&A function. We will aim to respond all questions towards the end of today's session. This session is being recorded. Subject to no technical difficulties, the talk will be available online as a podcast and video at a later date. Thank you very much for joining us today, and I'll now pass on over to Pierre. Pierre, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria. So I will start by sharing my screen. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Uh, I hope you can see the screen now. Yes, so that, that's fine. So, okay. So I will talk about the, the blue economy. The, the idea is not to give you a very academic presentation. I have to give a note on this. Uh, it's mainly based on the, the um, we can say the experience that we, I got and we got as a team uh, from the different intervention that we have made uh, at the country level. I think Maria was mentioning Bangladesh, Seychelles, the Bahamas, and now we are working, currently working in uh, Jamaica and in Madagascar, helping the World Bank to, to design uh, and to support this, this country for the economy um, implementation. So it's, it's mainly from, from this and also all the work that we have done at the continental or at the regional level. So the, the blue economy, so when it started, we can say a uh, long time ago, okay, and, uh, but not so long. 
Uh, if you remember, in 1992, we had the Rio summit, so the first uh, big uh, summit with the sustainability concept. Uh, we had 20 years after we had the Johannesburg one, uh, and uh, we continue to have some some summit. But the most important here is is the the one that you can see on the uh, in the middle is the Samoa UN conference on small on seeds, small Iceland developing seeds. So why uh, this is important for the blue economy? For a very simple reason is that all of these countries, and I think you can see on the, on the picture, they are surrounded by waters. If you take Kiribati, for instance, uh, between the two uh, islands uh, that are, uh, that are, how can I say that in English, from a uh, big distance from them, it's about 4,500 kilometers between the, these uh, two extreme islands. Uh, and they, just massive, massive. Uh, so water is the key things. And um, we were, for instance, discussing this morning with, with the World Bank on, the, on the, the big countries, the Pacific Island countries for the plastic pollutions. And we found out that, for instance, the 20, uh, for the plastic, the 20% plastic coming from the sea and the 80% plastic coming from the, the land that we use to say, you know, when we are talking about plastic pollution, that's maybe, you know, exactly the opposite for the, for the uh, Iceland countries. Okay, so it may be 80% coming from the sea and 20% coming from the land. So you see that that's the, the importance of the ocean. So at that time we did uh, some work with Iris Monlo on uh, Monroe uh, that is now a FAO officer in, in Barbados. We did some work on about unlocking the potential of the blue economy for the African seeds. And that was the first, uh, I think one of the first, yeah, the first UN uh, documents on the, on the, on the blue economy, uh, especially for the African one. So that was the, the beginning of something very important. And, and, the, and I think something that the, 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 the seeds are really pushing, and this is something very, very interesting, is that this initiative is not coming from the EU, not coming from the United States, or Canada, or even you know uh, Japan, you know countries like this. It's really coming from the small islands, developing states. So they have been pushing quite a lot since 2014 and 2017. So we had this uh, New York uh, Ocean Conference, uh, and this is where the blue economy and also with the, sustain the, the sustainable blue economy, you know, uh, really um, jump into the uh, political agenda. Uh, Quite recently, so we have the and this is for our friends who can read Arabic. Um, this is the African Union uh, economy strategy that we have developed uh, two years ago, and that was quite interesting because it really paved the way for the implementation of the blue economy at the continental level with all the difficulties that that we will see. In the meantime, and this is interesting, so we have a lot of what I call derived uh, or associated products. So we have the blue growth, so this is the EU. So if you want to know the difference between the blue growth and the blue economy, the blue growth is linked generally to the new activities uh, like the biotechnologies, uh, all the new activities, and the, the blue economy uh, from the EU point of view refers to the traditional activities. We have the ocean economy, ocean governance, that's the uh, UN, um, uh, UNEP is, is talking about ocean governance, and you can see that, for instance, the, the UNESCO chair that we got is on ocean governance. We ask uh, to have it on the blue governance, but they said no, because blue governance is still not in the UN uh, vocabulary. So we, we, we have it as, as a ancient governance, but it's, it's still good. Um, so the blue governance I was mentioning, the blue carbon that is coming up quite uh, significantly, uh, the blue guardians, the blue finance, the blue bond, the blue bells, uh, with the Commonwealth, and now you have a new one. I don't know if you're aware of it. It's the blue uh, wall that the IUCN and all UNECA and many countries in the uh, Western part of Africa are developing. So now you know that this is, so we, we have quite some history on this. The key issue, and this is uh, from, we can say from, uh, uh, um, 
so how do we define the blue economy and how do we deal with this? How do we manage the, its implementation? That's a very tricky thing. Um, in a way that um, you can see from these two figures that it's, it's about making leakages uh, between the social, the economics, the environment, but also between the different pillars of the, uh, of the economy. Okay, uh, so that's that's quite uh, really challenging. And thanks to you, uh, there's, a, there's a policy and book that has been developed. This is a tactic from this policy and book. And you can see how you can approach this step by step. Okay, uh, for instance, when we are designing a country blue economy, we are always referring to the one, the, the, the regional strategy and even the uh, continental strategy. So that's one thing, but we have also to refer to many other things like the circular economy. Uh, if we take Seychelles, for, for instance, we will go for the debt swap, et cetera, et cetera. So you see that is about making linkages between all of these things and to be to have the ability to put the people together to work something that really makes uh, everything uh, happening. Um, but uh, and and um, this is another thing that I think is quite relevant is that the the blue economy refers to all the SDGs, not only the SDG 13, uh, 14, you know about uh, the the ocean and of the life below water, but also. I mean, all the others from the one you know, to the 17. Of course, you know, the one of the 13 on the climate change is quite is quite important, but it refers to all of the SDG. And this is also important is that it refers not only to the oceans and the seas, but also to the continental waters. Um, in the way that in Africa, the if you take just for instance, the Lake uh, Victoria, uh, Tanzania and Kenya um, are taking more fish from the lake than they are taking fish from the sea. So you see the importance of the continental water. So that's why in the economy strategy of Africa, continental waters are, are, are key here, and, and we also included the rivers. Despite that, all of this effort that has been made, you know, to define the blue economy as something that is different from, we can say, the maritime economy or the sectorial economy. Uh, when you look at the literature, uh, even if uh, scientific papers that we review on a regular basis, to some sectors. Uh, like the fisheries, like the agriculture, uh, and the bank, for instance, in, in this publication by the World Bank, the blue economy is really presented sector by sector, okay, not in, within a very integrated approach. But thanks to the, we can say, to the transformative change of the, of the, we can say, the, the way the people are thinking, uh, the bank now is, is really thinking about having the blue economy as something that is integrated. Okay. This is, Quentin, we had a meeting I think, yesterday on, about the blue economy in Madagascar, and the, the focus was really about finding actions that can integrate, for instance, the uh, climate change and the aquaculture through the seaweed uh, production, seaweed farming, for instance. So that's a very good, uh, very good move. But in the mind of most of the policymakers and, and, and people in the funding agency is still a very traditional approach. So more or less, we change the world, we change the maritime economy, and we put blue economy instead. But uh, um, it doesn't make any change for them. I need to complete uh, change in the way of thinking, the use of the maritime, uh, maritime and, and continental waters. I was in Addis Abeba two weeks ago for the um, validation, ministerial validation of the uh, blue economy for IGAD. So IGAD is the Horn of Africa uh, Regional Economic Committee. And uh, every country made a speech. And again, you know, we can see that every country was talking about their fisheries, their aquaculture, their port development, their transportation. But nobody was talking about having some trans, trans uh, sectorial uh, activities or having a trans sectorial plan for their blue economy. 
So you see that there's still a long way to, to do. Okay, so this is why I said, you know, there, there's some change. Uh, I think the most advanced one at the moment is the uh, IOC, the Indian Ocean Commission. Uh, and I, I invite you to have a look on the, on the documents. So there's a lot of, uh, everything is done in a very uh, trans, uh, trans uh, way. Okay, so that, that's very interesting. Sisha has done quite a lot of progress on this. Bahamas on this, and this is interesting. Bahamas is very interesting because when we started to do that with the IDB, the Inter-American Development Bank, uh, that was uh, in uh, June, or, yeah, May or June 2019. And if you remember, the an hurricane uh, called Dorian hit the Bahamas, I think in mid-September uh, 2019. So before that, uh, the authorities, Bahamian Bahaman authorities, were mainly talking about blue finance, but and about how to increase the tourism activity, uh, the cruise activity, etc. After Dorian, the 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 the, the change the mind and they realized that they have to work quite significantly on the improvement of the resilience of the coastal. Um, uh, uh, just to, to let you know, you know, the two, two big islands on the north of Nassau, Great, uh, Great Tobacco and Grand Bahamas, have been completely destroyed. So, so people, that made, you know, uh, something about changing the mind of the people, okay? And uh, yes, so just in terms of uh, principle for the implementation, and this is why I was referring to the uh, this is the, the, the key thing. Uh, you, you need to be able to, to uh, develop your system around the circular economy. Otherwise, you know, we just you will just generate it waste uh, and and waste, and nobody will think about about the, the reducing this waste and or recycling, etc. Et so, circular economy is one of the key pillar for the for the development of the um, of the blue economy. The good governance. Okay, so that with that we know already. And also, you know, something that is important is about the environmental and the social sustainability. Okay, because the the world blue economy always refers, I mean, always in the mind of the people, it, it refers about the economic development. So we need to put this the environmental and social concern up front. And you will, I, I think, I, I will show you later why. And the other one that is. Um, more or less always left behind is about the inclusiveness and about the empowerment, especially uh, the, the people who don't have necessarily the voice. So that's the, 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 the key principle. Um, the other things that we notice is that, um, uh, that for, for instance, for Bangladesh, or on, that's for, on, the, the photo on, on the on the top and, and Senegal I think is on the below um, is that the people with the blue economy are, are just I mean the countries are dreaming okay in dreaming about developing you know the offshore fisheries developing uh, the oil exploitation developing the deep sea mining everything they want to do more or less everything um, and they are getting loans quite easily. For instance, Bangladesh got a loan of 250 millions from the World Bank, okay? And they will get another one, another 260, 70 million uh, quite soon. Um, Tanzania at the moment, so we are working with Tanzania with the EU. The EU will give about 110 million to Tanzania for developing their blue economy. So you see that there's, there's a lot of money you know, to do so a lot of money to do uh, many many good things if you if you put that in the right uh, in the right shape the, the, the key issue is that the people as I was mentioning the people in the country are dreaming about okay saying new things or developing all things but they are not thinking enough about fix, fixing the existing problem. And that's a key, key issue. So in Bangladesh, for instance, we have been working uh, about three years uh, to, to push for the, the ban of the trash fish. So that's in place now. But it took a while. And, and for the people, they didn't really understand why we should ban the trash fish while it's so good. So this is something that takes, takes time. 
Uh, migration, migratory fishery, for instance, in, in West Africa, it's about 25% of the catch. They are not recorded anywhere. Okay, so for Senegal, for instance, 80% of the exports to the EU is made of fish catch that is caught in Mauritanian, but mainly in the Guinea-Bissau Guinea uh, waters. Uh, and the last point with that, I think we will come back on this, is about the environmental protection that is we can say missing uh, in every uh, blue economy uh, plan at the moment. So uh, there are four four key issues. Maybe three, maybe we can we can lift uh, the last one. The, the first one is about the planning. So this is something uh, crucial for the development. Otherwise, so we have this ideal situation. I think this is coming from the EU website, uh, where everything is in harmony. And you have the other one, I think is in Chittagong or Dhaka in Bangladesh, where uh, it takes about three hours to do about 15 kilometers uh, in both cities, you know, both in Chittagong and Dhaka because of the traffic jam. So if you don't want to have traffic jam at the you need you definitely need to plan and plan ahead, not only for avoiding traffic jam, but also to, uh, to secure the investment because the people, when if they want to build a big hotel, a five-star hotel on a very nice beach, they don't want to have somebody, you know, drilling some oil in front of, if in just near the beach or just in front of, of them or having some aquaculture development there. Okay. So you need to have uh, very good planning that to, to see what we, what, what you want to do and how you, you can uh, manage the space and how you can have the people, especially the key investor on. The coordination is something that is, I think, is even the most difficult things to, to organize. In the way that uh, when you are working with one ministry, the other ministry is the first one. Uh, so you need to have a supra ministerial coordination unit in place in order to be able to. Uh, move the things forward and have the people working together. And believe me, it's a very challenging thing. It took about three years, uh, again, three years in Bangladesh, to have the people that uh, in the different ministry admitting that they have to work together for the development of the blue economy. Okay. Um, so that, that's something very important. And, may, and most of the time, the Blue Economy Coordination Unit is located in, within the Fishery mi, mi, uh, Ministry or the Fishery Department, which is a completely wrong location in the way that everybody is associated the Blue Economy with the fisheries only. So, for, so, so the Seychelles has made this mistake. Uh, Mauritius is as this as this issue at the moment. So it, and after it's very difficult to move forward and to change the mind of the people and tell them that blue economy is also coastal tourism is also uh, aquaculture is also port development. So that's something something that takes a lot of time and a lot of energy in each country and, and even you know at the at the African level or at the uh, uh, RECS, the regional economic committee level. System services, that's the, the poor, we can say the poor parents of the blue economy in the way that is always uh, forgotten. Uh, despite uh, the new, we can say the new fashion about the blue carbon and how, you know, how the, the coastal ecosystem and the sea can provide some good help, you know, for the climate change mitigation and adaptation. So that's something that I think we, we will yeah, just see after. Um, just, just to give you uh, an idea about the, the blue economy in Africa. So this is something that we have done for the African strategy. And you can see that, for instance, the fishery is not so important in terms of value addition. So on, on, the, on the top one is the value addition and the, the bottom one is the employment. But, and, and you can see that, uh, so what we did is that we, we made some projection for 2030 and 2063. 2063 is with the uh, 2063 African agenda and 2030 is to fit with the SDG. And you can see that clearly, you know, the, the coastal uh, tourism will be the one that will employ uh, very high uh, about, I think it's about 35 million of people. 
uh, while the fishery you know, is we remain about 15 million. So that's um, brought us some some um, some idea about looking at not only and uh, the, the development in terms of value addition or in terms of jobs, but also looking at the job, uh, the, the work conditions here. And uh, so this is why we are uh, and um, developing with uh, ILO, the International Labor Organization, some, some pilot project to look at this, especially for the coastal tourism in East and, and West Africa to see about uh, to really to look at the, the work conditions in order that the blue economy is not um, something that will uh, prove, uh, put the people you know, in, uh, in, uh, in war situation at the moment. Um, but to do that, and we face a very challenging, um, a very challenge, big challenge, is it was about um, how do you define, you know, the first the baseline, and and secondly, how do you, how are you able to monitor the progress that you are making with the blue economy? And for that, we had we had to develop with Unica. We developed uh, two two years ago some account, uh, accountability systems. So we, we call it the Blue Economy Valuation Toolkit that allow us to uh, evaluate the progress, uh, not only from the economic side with the value addition and the jobs, but also from the environmental science, looking at the ecosystem services and from the social science, looking at some uh, a set of indicators. And that's a, that's a critical thing uh, to do. Otherwise, you implement your blue economy, but you don't know if it's better, if it's better for the economic, if it's better for the environment or for the people. So you need to have a very good accounting system. So this is something that we are working on at the moment, and uh, we should get something in, 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 in place at the African level very soon with the help of the African Union the EU and, uh, and, and a few other um, agencies. So the coastal ecosystems, and this is interesting because we have just completed the work for the African Development Bank uh, with some colleagues at the center and some people from, from in, in Africa. Uh, the report will be soon, will be released very soon and we should have a workshop, I think by the end of May. So if you want to attend, you can just send me an email. But what we found that with this uh, African, um, uh, when we assess the future of the fishery is that more or less by 2050, we will have uh, a need, an additional needs about 12 to, uh, yeah, no, 12 is about for 2030 and it will be 18 million tons that we will need on the top of what we have at the moment, which is about 12, to feed uh, the people, the African continent, at the same level than today, which is about eight kilogram of fish per day, uh, per year, sorry, uh, per uh, capita. So you see that uh, 18,000 million, that's quite a lot, okay? And but we found that, that if, not, if you are able to restore the ecosystem, not at the pristine uh, level, but in a good shape, you, we can um, uh, extract about 10 million tons. We will have more, uh, and uh, the, the abundance of the, the fish stock will be about 10 million tons. And, and we, we provide additional way to, to, to have the, 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 the 8 million ton that is still missing. But, the ecosystem, so you can see that the ecosystem is the key things here uh, to um, put, uh, to improve the economic conditions of the fisheries and also to nourish the people. So we did some, some, some work with Iwan e e Trigaro. So with Iwan, e we have been working quite, uh, for quite a long time now within the French initiative for the coral reef restoration, IFRECO, and we have done some economic uh, ecosystem valuation studies in all the uh, French overseas territory. So we applied this and he, he developed a very interesting way to, um, to assess uh, the health of the ecosystems. And this is why this is what you are presented here for the different LMEs in Africa. And you can see that uh, except the kelp forests that are about 75% you know, of their, um, in, in terms of uh, good, good health, 
all of the other ones are not in a very good uh, shape. Okay, so it means that a lot of effort have to be put into this uh, ecosystem uh, restoration. So this is why also we why we have um, a set of projects on the um, NBS nature based solution both in in Europe in the Caribbean and we are developing one in the um, in West Africa. So. Uh, Saying this, and you can see there, I will not go into the details, but uh, depending of the like the seagrasses or, or the tidal march or the, the pigeon and the mangrove, they are absorbing a lot of carbon. And this is interesting because um, uh, Cabo Verde, for instance, is the first country that has um, put the seagrasses into the NDC. The NDC is the national determined contribution. Uh, following the Paris Agreement in 2015, so every country has to uh, provide uh, some actions or to, to implement some action toward the mitigation and the adaptation to the climate change. So you see that the ecosystem is not only good for the fish uh, production, I mean, as a nursery or as, as an habitat, but it's also very good for the carbon. And uh, so we, we found out that this is something that we can use. And uh, if you have in mind, uh, the, the COP26 was a big success in terms of attendance. Uh, the COP15, uh, nobody's talking about that. So you can see that there's a big discrepancy that are made for the uh, biodiversity and for the ecosystems themselves and the effort that I made for the climate change. And now, for instance, within the new uh, EU framework for um, supporting countries, 50% of the money is dedicated to the climate change actions. It was about 30% before within the 11 EDF uh, framework. So you, that's, so you see that the money is going not to the biodiversity or not to anything else, but is going mainly to the, the channel of the um, uh, climate change. So we started to have a look in West Africa and we are continuing and we start a new project, a uh, new program funded by the Mara Foundation, looking at the seagrasses in the West African, six West African countries, and to see how we can uh, develop measures to Im Im improve them, uh, conserve them, and uh, put them within the, the NDCs of these countries. And you can see here that the uh, just for the MPAs, and we are working quite uh, also on the MPAs, uh, for some countries, it's quite significant. And you can see, for example, Guinea-Bissau, you know, is about uh, three times uh, what, what they plan to do. Uh, Guinea is about 30%, Sierra Leone is almost 40%, okay? So that's quite significant. So it means that when you are protecting your environment, you can have a very high return on this. Um, so this is something that I was mentioning. So the, the money is, is going to the climate change. So there's something very interesting to do at, at the moment is about using this money that goes to the climate change for the improvement of the biodiversity. So that's something uh, that we need to, to do. The, the challenge here is about, uh, and especially with the MBS, the nature-based solution is about, is about to be very, critical here yeah, and not select the species that for instance absorb the most the highest level of carbon say for the seagrasses you have different species okay same for the mangroves okay so we have to be very very careful here yeah. but we have a very kind of very big uh, window of opportunity about using climate change to restore the environment um just a thing to complete so we have done so that's about the the um, the, the biodiversity and then the, the network and the, how useful can be the MPA. So we have a new paper I think that will be published very soon on on this about the importance of the uh, uh, preserved ecosystem for the for the climate change. And I think uh, that's the last one. Um, so in summary, the the, the the blue economy is it's something that is interesting uh, if it can make some change in the way the people are looking at the uh, the oceans and the water. So that's something uh, very, very critical. They have to think globally, they have to think holistically. 
And there are two things about making action that are cross-cutting, uh, linking, for instance, the pollution, the plastic pollutions with, uh, uh, with the human health and etc. So that, that's important. But to do, to do that, you need to be very well uh, aware of what you have okay, in terms of um, uh, potentials. So that's something that is, is, uh, is, is critical. And at the moment, uh, in more or less every, every country, the country don't really know what are the potential. Okay? So that's something that needs to be done. And when the potential is on the deep sea mining, on the or on the oil exploitation, this is where, especially where you need a very strong public consultation, and not only consultation to other people to say yes, this is good, but a very strong involvement of the of the people. So I was mentioning the coordination and planning. So this is key uh, at all levels. Okay, and something that I didn't mention too much is, is the capacity building. Uh, we need to do that, and this has to be done at every level. I was mentioning the policymakers at the Addis Ababa meeting a few days ago, and it's the same at every level. And I can, when I see, and I, I, I think I evaluate pe uh, papers from journal every week on blue economy, I think this is the same uh, education that we have to do at the at the at the research level, you know, in order to really go a bit beyond that the traditional approach of the maritime sector or the, the sectorial approach. Funding is important, the financing is important, but the money is available, and uh, it's just a question of of uh, having some ability to to get it. And of course, the the last point, you know, is about the maritime sovereignty. And uh, we have someone at the at the center doing a thesis on this. Um, so Sophie is 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 really working on this, and this is of course very important. And this is why, for instance, in 2014, when Bangladesh won a claim against India and another one against Malama, this is the starting point of the blue economy uh, development. And for all of this, so this is why you need a blue governance. So Thank you so much, Pierre. That was uh, a tour de force. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I suspect our audience has as well. I've got a couple of questions, but before I get to them, um, I'll just have a look and I'll broadcast some of the questions that our audience has, has asked. And could I just remind the audience that you can continue to put your questions in the Q&A box. So um, Manuel Castillo Duran asks, are, is there any multilateral in instance that is trying to effectively unify the different initiatives that you have talked about? This, this is one of the key issues. I, I, I give you a very practical example. Um, so the African Union has developed his, his own blue economy strategy. UNEP uh, as is developing his ocean, I mean the African ocean uh, uh, economy strategy. Okay. And sometimes the, so they are, uh, I mean, for the last workshop, for instance, they are invited the African Union people at the last minute. So you see that there is, and there's a big uh, competition between the agencies as well. Okay, for instance, uh, we were in a meeting uh, a few weeks ago with the Abidjan Convention. So that's the, you know, the UNEP Regional Sea uh, Organization. So the Abidjan Convention now uh, has the mandate for the implementation of the blue economy for all the countries in the um, uh, Atlantic uh, side. So you see that there's a lot of conflicts. And uh, on the top of that, every Rex is developing his own blue economy strategy. We are contributing to the one for SADC, which is, I think, 15 countries in the south of Africa. But SADC is one, but you have the commissar on the top, and commissar has done his one. So there's a validation workshop, I think, in the end of May. 
some countries are part of, of course, of SADEC and, and, and COMESA at the same time, and some other are even part of the uh, Eastern African com uh, community. So you see there's a lot of overlapping and a lot of competitions. But one of the key things I think is the, that we have to work on is to harmonize, especially with the UN agencies that are everybody's pushing and or pulling you know, the blue economy uh, on its side. Yes, I think we've hit on one of the key problems in global governance, <laughs> the multiplicity of, of fora and the challenges that that brings. Um, we've got some other very interesting questions in the, in, in the box. So uh, oh, apologies if I mispronounce this, but Swayan Prabha Das asks uh, a very pertinent question about how gender and inclusion are incorporated into blue economy projects and how has this been received by governments and people and populations and, and private sector involvement as well. So how is this brought in? You talked a lot towards the end, especially about bringing in people and not just for consultation. So how has this worked? Yeah, that, that's a key, key issue. Um, when we did the African Union strategy, uh, I, I remember we had uh, not some complaints, but some, some, some uh, fishermen association that were raising the issue that the, the small scale fishery was left behind. And, and it was very surprising for us because we, we made a lot of effort to do that, to put that into the strategy, but, and the, but this, is, this is what they, they, they felt. So, so this is why I said that right from the beginning, it's very, very important to have the, the, the I mean, all the people on board. That's something very, uh, very, very important. Yeah. Especially the people who don't have a big voice, we can say, or we don't, that are not, you know, part of the usual uh, workshops and things like this. So that's, that's something important. And we try to develop that in Bangladesh, for instance, and, 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 and for the, in, in the beginning, it was completely, um, it's like we were talking of something that was not real. I mean, we were asking something that for them, it was a bit shocking for the, for the government. But that's something very, very important to do. Just as a quick follow up, because it is very difficult, not in, with regards to the blue economy and to any project mm -hmm. involving the public, uh, it is difficult to, to create that space where different groups can be included and participate in decision making rather than just having some sort of enhanced consultation. Can you? Are you aware of any example of somewhere where this has really worked and what was it that made it work in that case? Yeah, they, there's, there's one example. Um, it's, it's in the Réunion Island in France. Okay, so they, are, they have set up a process and, and this is why is it, I think it works, is that they set up a process of two years of consultation with large groups, with everybody, a large group of uh, fishermen representative, uh, fishmonger representative, uh, and with many, many women there, okay? Um, and small groups, more for the expertise and things like this. And that took two years. And, and the, the outcome is very, very good because everybody have, has the, everybody have the feeling that this is their strategy and they are part of the strategy. So that, that the, this feeling is something very, very important, you know, to have the feeling that you are part of something. Thank so you. People are proud of this. Yes, yeah, so they, they take ownership as well in participating. Yes, the, the other example, but that's on the other side, okay, uh, is Seychelles and uh, Mauritius at the moment, is that they, they didn't work enough on the, uh, for the consultations and for the integration of the people. So that's why at the end, so the, the Blue Economy Unit or the Department of Blue Economy was attached to the, uh, to the presidency during the, uh, within the, the, the former president and with the new president because he assimilated Blue Economy to the fishery. So he put that in the fishery ministry. And because there were no stakeholder engagement 
and they tried to do it, but it failed. And uh, the people in Seychelles just assimilated blue economy to uh, fisheries. So that was, it's, it's a big failure. Thank you. So linked to that, Hannah asks, how can we ensure that the economy, society and environment are considered equally at once? Or is it a question of an average over time and one may be sacrificed at one moment at the expense of another? Yeah, but this is what I, yeah, I, I fight a lot for this. And I put always the environment uh, first, okay? And, uh, and this is what we put, for instance, within the, the, um, the African report, uh, the, the report that we are doing on the future of the African fisheries for the African Development Bank. We put the environment first. I mean, in the way that if you restore the environment, you will get much more fish and you will also fight the climate change. Okay. So I'm saying the climate change, we, we have to see, the, you see it as a, re, a big opportunity to put the environment up front. Uh, for instance, in the Bahamas, I was mentioning Bahamas, but now the, all the big uh, insurance company, including AXA, are working quite a lot to improve the resilience of the ecosystem because they found out that it's cheaper for them to pay some uh, restoration or improvement of the ecosystem than to pay the damages at the end. So that's, I think we have a very good window of opportunity at the moment with the climate change. So we should take it to put the environment first. Thank you. And I found it very interesting that it was the economic argument actually that then helps to, to, to raise the, the concern about the environmental degradation. So we've got uh, some very interesting questions. Uh, one is, uh, are there blue economy projects or efforts in Europe? Yes, uh, there's, there's a, I mean, Europe, Europe is really pushing a lot, especially for the uh, economic, what, what, what I call, you know, what I presented as the blue growth. Okay? There's a lot of initiative. I've been part of one of a project a few years ago, and there was absolutely fascinating about, and it was really about combining things. So I was mainly working with FAO on the project in, in uh, Guyana, in the French Guyana, about um, setting, up, setting up a new offshore port, because the port of Cayenne is, is about, um, because of the, the sand that is coming from the river, so it's very difficult. You, you cannot have big boats you know, coming to the port. So to have an offshore port with a big offshore platforms, uh, completely uh, self-sufficient in terms of energy and with a big aquaculture production. And there was a lot of uh, very, very nice project using tidal energy, uh, everything. So, so it's really upfront on this. And you can have a look on the European websites. It's, it's very impressive. And Europe also is the one that uh, has developed some key, I think there are 11 principles for the blue financing. So they are really upfront on this and they are really pushing at the moment. So for instance, they are the one that is uh, supporting Tanzania for the development of this blue economy. They are the one that is supporting SADEC and the, and the, the Benguela current for the blue economy. So they, yeah, they are really pushing a lot. For Bangladesh, they are the one who's supporting Bangladesh for this as well. Thank you. Uh... I've been saving two questions uh, and they're, they're really, I think, lovely questions because they're people who want to get involved. So one of them comes from Stuart Green, who's asking, what advice would you have for the philanthropic donors working in this space? Well, just to give us uh, their money, that, that's, uh, <laughs> that's good. No, there's, there's a lot to do, but um, I think Feinstein for the, the MAVA Foundation, is, is uh, supporting us to, to assess the seagrasses services in West Africa. So it's, it's mainly three, three types of services. It's mainly the, the nursery uh, services, the, the carbon sequestration. And I think there's, I'm trying to remember the other one. I forgot the other one. Uh, uh, yes, is the water, water um, purification and, and the, the slowing down you know the the movement of the the waves okay so but so that that's a very good way because they are really thinking about putting the environment first and linking what we can do and what we can found uh, 
for the policy implementation. So for the NDCs, but also for biodiversity, uh, for improving the MPAs management, things like this. So, so I think the philanthropy uh, foundation are very, very important for this. But I have to say, but because uh, some of them are, I think, are, are going a bit in the wrong direction is that, for instance, within the MPAs and, and now with the blue carbon, is that they want to have to be the, the, the first one or they want to be the, the one that are, is supporting the biggest MPA or the biggest blue carbon project that we can see, for instance, in Madagascar or in Kenya. So there's, we have to be careful on this, but they can do a lot. That's for sure. And again, another offer to get involved. So we've got Dominic Uchi uh, from Nigeria, who's, a, uh, who's an agricultural extension by profession. And he's asking, what is the position of agricultural extension and how is it linked uh, to this in, in, you know, these innovations in farming? How can that be linked to the blue economy? And how could somebody working in that area get involved? Okay. Yeah, the aquaculture at the moment is in, is very interesting because uh, for from we can say for many years aquaculture was regarding as something to complement fisheries. Okay, more or less it was the company. And now is because it's becoming especially in Nigeria. You can see in Nigeria. I don't know how how, how what is the volume of cat catfish and tilapia production, but is about 600,000 ton or maybe even 700,000 ton now. And, and it, it has been multiplied by 10 over the last 10 years, more or less. And, and Ghana next door is doing the same, but with, with a lower level of production, but it's doing the same. You multiply by 10 in 10 years. So that's very important. But now the, the, the idea within the blue economy is, is not only to produce fish, it's about producing fish and uh, doing something nice for the environment or for the climate change. So that's why, for instance, in Madagascar, there's a lot of development for the, the, the aquaculture linkage, making a link between the seagrasses or the aqua, aqua algae, algae productions, fish productions, and carbon sequestrations. So that's interesting. So, so it's always the link. In Bangladesh, we can see the same. Um, we can see the same with the, uh, there's a Dutch project with the Kulna University trying to do to improve the mangrove with some shrimp, shrimp farming. And if you remember, you know, in 2004, when we had this, this big um, disaster in, in Southeast Asia, because people were just cut, have been cut the mangrove to make, to, 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 to have some shrimps, you can see that, that we are using shrimps to restore the mangroves. So that's interesting. So there's a lot to do, and there's a lot to do, uh, especially uh, in the Niger Delta, uh, in, in Nigeria, about developing some mariculture that can, that can combine you know, both the, the environmental benefits and economic benefits, and also for the population. I mean, for in Madagascar, in, in Asia, the seaweeds aquaculture is is, is, is led by women and it's very, very good, I mean, for their empowerment and for their, for their freedom, we can say. Thank you, that's a wonderful, the wonderful example of how, how everything is inter interrelated and integrated. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question uh, from Manuel Castrillo Duran and he's uh, highlighting the importance of educational processes and how they should integrate into formal and informal education, things like information about the blue economy, oceans, et cetera. But he's asking how adequate is that information uh, that exists at the moment for less qualified populations? How accessible is that information? Yeah, that, that's a key issue. Um, we, we have been working recently and, and, and people in the group in the center with the, um, with the uh, Open University in Mauritius to set up uh, a master program in blue economy. And of course, this is not available for everybody, but this is, this is something that has been done. The, at, the, at the available for everybody, I can send you, uh, I have done something uh, mainly for, yeah, for everybody, for all the public, for the, within the, 
GCCA Plus initiative, which is the global global change, global climate change uh, action of the EU. So, and it's I think you have the like the basis information for the blue economy, and and, and that that's quite useful because it's based on practical examples. But that's that's something that this is that is missing is about the education of the of everybody. Yeah. The, just to, to follow on this, we have some um, developed with UNICA and EDEP, which is the institute, I think is in French, is for the, it's, it's part of the UNICA. It has been set up at Samir Amin in the beginning of the 70s, just after the, uh, the independence. Um, and we have some online sessions uh, available and uh, free for everybody uh, on the Blue Economy Accounting. And we have completed with the Bangladesh Maritime University uh, a blue economy uh, lectures, a series of 12 lectures for, for everybody as well. So that's that's available. Thank you. That's fantastic. And I noticed Sophie has also been putting links to what you've been saying in the chat so that people can okay. access these resources. Uh, Kevin Kwan asks. Um, about time scale. So what is the time scale for measuring baselines or for measuring the impacts of blue economy projects? How long does it take to be able to accurately describe the current state and the benefits of a program? Yeah, the, the, the baseline is, um, is quite challenging um, to do in, in the way that uh, you, have to, you have to give information for the economic, the environment, and the and the social, and usually when you have good economic data, you don't have anything from the environment. Like in Jamaica at the moment, there's almost nothing. Uh, but in some other countries where you have uh, NGOs working for a long time, like in Madagascar, uh, you have all the uh, environmental information. So, for instance, we have been able to map uh, the sea grasses, the mangrove, the reefs, and the beaches in Madagascar for the the fourteen provinces. Okay, quite easily in a week time. So it it's all depends on the country. Uh, for Bangladesh, uh, it took us, we did a report with the bank on this, and it took us about two weeks sitting with the people in the statistical office, uh, working with them, digging the data, and just to have the value added of the different sectors. Okay. So it all depends. And, and But this is why the accounting system is the key things, and this is why we are pushing a lot. And Unica will give a, um, a, tra a training for all the EGAT countries uh, on the, the use of this Blue Economy Toolkit, Valuation Toolkit, and because it's it's a really good way, a very quick way to, to have a baseline study. Okay, We do that at the moment in, in Tanzania with Unica. Uh, it takes about three weeks to get everything, okay? And after you can, every year you can have a look and, and you can record the progress if, if there is any progress. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a couple of questions on industry. So Hannah asks, can all existing industries be part of the blue economy or will some industries need to be phased out? That, that's a key issue. I mean, the, uh, for instance, we, we have published a paper, I think quite recently in Frontier in Marine Science, where we looked at the fisheries. Uh, and and we, we have developed a method many years ago in a, in a, in a project um, we call the ECOS that, that, that is based on the societal cost of the activities. So more or less you sum up the, the different costs from the environment to the economics. For example, if you are exporting the fish and uh, the people are suffering from malnutrition in your country uh, and to the social, you know, if the job is, 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 is taken by uh, foreigners, et cetera. So you can sum up all of these costs and, and on the other side, you sum up the uh, benefits and you can see, you know, what you can do, okay? So this is something you need to have some way of measurements but the question is not about kicking out you know, some, some industry or something, it's about to be able to provide solution for improving them. So that's really the, the, the solution. 
because for instance, if you if you if we go in that way, for instance, we had this this discussion this morning with with the bank and the the, the countries in the Pacific. The question was very simple from the World Bank: Do we invest in the in the uh, in countries for the development of their uh, processing capacities for fish or not, or is there any future? The problem. So we we say yeah, that can be possible, but they will have much more pollutions associated. So you need to make a balance. So how do we reduce the pollution and make the economic development at the same time? So it's it's a tricky question, but the but the idea, the fundamental idea, is, is to is to keep everybody on board and to improve the sustainability of every activity. Thank you, and I'll abuse my position as chair to ask sneak in one final question. Um, so I was wondering whether COVID has caused any shift in thinking. I'm thinking, for example, you put quite a lot of emphasis on coastal tourism and the forecasts for you know, very substantial growth in that area. Uh, and of course that can be done in, a, in different ways, but it can be done in an environmentally sensitive way if, if, if you're aware of it. Uh, but I wonder whether there's been a shift away maybe from thinking about tourism and more towards uh, using minerals or gas or oil uh, resources, for example, as countries try to become increasingly um, Sufficient, self-sufficient in these areas? Yes, yes and no. Okay, yes for the country that can afford that. Okay, uh, but it's interesting to see, there's a few papers now that, that you, can, you can find on the effect of the COVID, uh, like in Thailand, for instance. Okay, and, and traumatic improvement of the, of the marine ecosystem. Traumatic, okay. Uh, Bahamas is the same. Bahamas, they were they were complaining a lot with the cruise shipping because the cruise ship, you know, were used. They had this bad habit, you know, to throw away, you know, many many things before coming to the port, and they found out that the water is 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 in a better quality. But that's I uh, would say Bahamas and and and, uh, and Thailand, they can afford, you know, to have a better policy regarding tourism. Okay, but other countries like, for instance, Madagascar uh, or many many other uh, other countries. They cannot afford, you know, to to make, you know, such choices. But this is, I mean, on the long term, we should be able to 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 demonstrate that there is a long term benefit for the country to go for uh, selected uh, tourism or eco tourism or things like that, and not mass tourism. And they used to, have. but the country, I think, all countries that I know are realizing that they were going in the wrong direction. So that, that's okay. And, and we've got another question has popped up in the Q&A from Marie-Laure Drouet. At what point is the conscience and action of circular economy embedded now in the, in, in the, in, in the program? So to what extent is the awareness of the circular economy included in programs? Um, well, it's it's very 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 low, okay. Um, and but thanks to the initiative for the like the the one for the uh, Indian Ocean Commission is is coming up uh, up front into the, the political agenda. So so we are working at the moment, and I, I, we invite you to go to the uh, uh, IOC website because there's a lot of information. And uh, so we have started to design some policy framework for each of the eight uh, islands around Africa. So both on the Atlantic and the, and the uh, Indian Ocean. Uh, so we have a, developed a, a circular economy um, uh, framework with some, some people from the center, Meli Miali from, from Madagascar, and, uh, and also some uh, guidelines for the entrepreneurs to develop their own business. So from moving from one business to a more a circular one for the recycling. So all of this that, that we have developed and now there's a new phase that we will implement. And I think the bank is, is, is working on this uh, to put that a bit more, even more on the, you can say about, about, uh, for having the people thinking about circular economy first before thinking about development. So that's something that is coming. But um, 
yes, it's it's very far, I think, at the moment from the the concerns of the of the policymakers, especially in, in the in the low developing uh, states. Yeah, thank you very much. I know I've learned a lot. I'm sure our audience has as well. Thank you, not just for taking the time to speak to us today, but also for all the amazing work you do across the planet uh, to, to, to improve our oceans, to improve our health, to improve uh, communities. Thank you so much. I think the one down, the, the crucial downside of this online format is that you can't see everybody applauding. So I'll applaud on behalf of everybody else. I'm sure they're all applauding at, okay. at, Thank you. at in their homes as well. Thank you very much, Pierre. It's been a real pleasure and good luck with your many, many projects. Bye-bye. Oh. And thank, thank you, you to all our audience for joining us this afternoon. Okay. Thanks a lot for everybody. Thank you.